Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. In the last module, Critical Discourse Analysis 1, we discussed the concept in some detail. In this module, we will look at the two models of Critical Discourse Analysis, the model given by Norman Fairclough and the model given by Van Dyke. Fairclough essentially looks at critical discourse analysis of texts, discursive practices and social practices as a means of social change. Van Dyke perceives CDA to be useful in identifying the differences between self and the other manifest in general discourse of society. Let's now look at the two models. In his uh, writings in 1992, 1995, 1999 and 2003, Fairclough devises a CDA framework for the analysis of discourse in society. It is based on a view of semiosis that includes language as an integral component of material social processes. He reasons that CDA examines the dialectical interplay between semiosis and other components of social practices. Central to Fairclough's theoretical orientation to discourse is a three-level analysis of discourse which examines not only linguistic features of a text but also processes of text production distribution and interpretation, that is discursive practices as well as the socio-cultural structures and practices in which a text is embedded. The most elaborate articulation of this framework is Fairclough 1992. It is based on the view that any discursive event consists of three layers. One, it is a spoken or written text. Two, it is an instance of discursive practice which involves the production and interpretation of the text. And three, it is an instance of social practice. Uh, see uh, figure for example. Fairclough argues that any analysis of a discursive event should go through these three dimensions. First, he conceives of textual analysis as one which combines analysis of both form and meaning. He views texts as incorporating ideational, interpersonal and textual meanings which correspond to Halliday's language metafunctions that he proposed in 1985. The first level involves a description of the formal features of the text which covers traditional levels of linguistic structures such as phonology, semantics, syntax and pragmatics as well as textual organizations such as cohesion between sentences and other aspects of textual structures above the sentence. Analysis typically focuses on clause level grammatical categories such as transitivity, modality, thematization and cohesion. It also looks into the ideologically rooted grammatical processes of nominalization and passivization that foregrounds or backgrounds the role of participants and their realization as agency or their omissions in a process. In this respect, Fairclough heavily draws on Halliday's systemic functional linguistics. In the second level, discursive practice is seen as mediating the relation between text and socio-cultural practice. Here, critical analysts probe into processes of text production distribution and reception. 
that is they investigate the ways in which text producers and interpreters draw on particular discursive practices and conventions which can be realized in the linguistic features of a text that is they investigate the ways in which text producers and interpreters draw on particular discursive practices and conventions which can be realized in the linguistic features of a text fakeloff takes an intertextual view of text that relates to the various traces of other discourses genres and voices etc drawn upon in the production and comprehension of a text he cites kristeva who historicizes the construction of texts from other texts every text is built upon responds to and derives from previous texts and in this way takes part in the formulation of history itself prepares for processes of change and helps construct successive texts fakeloff draws a distinction between manifest intertextuality and constitutive intertextuality or interdiscursivity manifest intertextuality refers to features of other texts which are explicitly demarcated and implicitly cued in the text examples of manifest intertextuality include reported speech presupposition meta discourse negation and irony interdiscursivity highlights the heterogeneity of text construction as one text type is shaped by a blend of elements of orders of discourse such as genres discourses narratives styles or activity types which text producers orient to and articulate in their discourses fakeloff 1999 a case is made for a textual analysis which combines linguistic analysis and intertextual analysis as a necessary component of discourse analysis in social scientific research the third level in fakeloff's model focuses on explaining the interplay between discourse as a social practice and other social practices and structures whereby analysts examine the situational institutional and wider socio political and cultural contexts and practices in which the text is embedded in this level power relations hegemony and ideological processes are particularly scrutinized in their relation to the particular discursive event Fakeloff focuses on the role of discourse in contemporary social life and on changes in discursive practices in relation to contradictions and struggles in social and cultural practices and processes an example of these discursive shifts is an apparent democratization of discourse such as a tendency to eliminate explicit power markers between people of asymmetrical institutional power relations for instance between teachers and students or doctors and patients a second example involves a tendency towards informality in institutionalized discourses especially the conversationalization of public discourses you can also see Fowler 1991 Let's move on to Van Dyck's socio cognitive discourse analysis In his work on news discourse racism and ideology Van Dyck views discourse as both social and cognitive and devises a three dimensional multidisciplinary CDA framework 
that he terms the discourse cognition society triangle. Analysis typically begins with an examination of overall topics. Semantic and schematic organization of a text or a group of texts. This is followed by analysis of local meanings such as word meanings, propositional meanings, coherence between propositions and implicit meanings including presuppositions, implications, vagueness and so on. Analysis of formal features focuses on sentence and clause structures including active and passive voice and nominalization, rhetoric, rhetorical figures and other features of spontaneous talk such as repairs, hesitations, etc. Examining the cognitive dimension of discourse involves a focus on the notion of mental models which are a schematic representation of the personally and socially relevant dimension of events such as setting participants in various roles, actions and so on. According to Van Dyke, mental models are crucial for discourse production and comprehension since they link personal beliefs and knowledge, social knowledge, attitudes and representations and discourse structures. Analysis of the cognitive dimension of discourse also involves an examination of the collective social attitudes, knowledge, ideologies and belief systems shared by social members in a society, that is social cognition. The third dimension involves an analysis of social interaction and situations at a local level and an analysis of social groups, organizations and institutions at a global level. In this context, CDA locates its interest in examining issues of the production and reproduction of social power and domination. In much of his work that came in 1988, 1991, 1995, 1998, 2001 on dominant everyday and elite discourses, Van Dyck suggests that an overall discourse strategy of positive self-presentation and negative other presentation permeates these discourses. He refers to this macro strategy as the ideological square model by which our positive actions and their negative actions are emphasized on the one hand and our negative actions and their positive actions are hedged mitigated or even excluded on the other. Van Dyck suggests that this ideological square can be located on all levels of discourse structures, for example, thematic organization and topical choice, lexical style, implicit meanings, syntactic structures, metaphor, argumentation, modality, hyperboles and euphemisms among other features. Similarly, as part of an overall positive self-presentation strategy, Van Dyck in 1991 and 1992 refers to various strategic moves that is disclaimers of denying racism such as an apparent denial, I have nothing against them but these denials are called apparent because what usually comes after but typically says something negative about them. Van Dyck mentions several of these semantic moves. Some of them have been reproduced here for you. One, apparent concession. Most of them are law-abiding citizens but number two, contrast. We are not intolerant, but they are. Reversal, blame the victim. They act in such a way that prejudice or unequal treatment is justified. 4. Mitigation and excuse. The police were forced to act in this harsh way. 5. 
ridicule using ridicule to discredit the opponent let's now move on to the concept of discourse as social practice new conceptions of discourse and a politicized view of language particularly since the early 1970s have given rise to diverse approaches within discourse analysis which have focused on the interplay between language meaning making and social structures widdison 1995 points out that discourse is in vogue and vague this popularity and vagueness of discourse according to jaworski and kupland 1999 can be related to two simultaneous developments the first involves a shift in epistemology in the theorizing of knowledge whereby many disciplines do not simply see language as a neutral medium for the transmission and reception of pre-existing knowledge but rather as playing a central role in the construction of knowledge jaworski and kupland point out that this shift in epistemology is generally referred to in social sciences as the linguistic turn the second development is due to the expanding scope of linguistics as it has moved away from being an inward looking discipline that tended to focus on providing dramatical and sentence level descriptions of language to the broader and contextualized study of language in its socio historical political and cultural formations and contexts theoretical orientations which embrace the notion of discourse as essentially a social practice embedded in larger social structure and practices have constituted a catalyst for the emergence of cda as a research tradition that sees discourse in a dialectical relationship with other social conditions and practices wodak 1996 suggests a definition of discourse which goes in tandem with the principles of critical discourse analysis it reads something like this critical discourse analysis sees discourse the use of language in speech and writing as a form of social practice describing discourse as a social practice implies a dialectical relationship between a particular discursive event and the situation institution and social structure that frame it the discursive event is shaped by them but it also shapes them that is discourse is socially constituted as well as socially conditioned it constitutes situations objects of knowledge and the social identities of and relationships between people and groups of people it is constitutive both in the sense that it helps sustain and reproduce the social status quo and the sense that it contributes to transforming it other definitions seem to share the same view of discourse as wodak for example fekloff construes the term discourse in two distinct ways first discourse as an abstract noun which refers to language use as a form of social practice secondly discourse as a count noun which involves ways of representing aspects of the world examples of the latter include neo conservative discourse feminist discourse the political discourse of the new labor etc g makes an alternative distinction between big d discourse and little d discourse discourse with a little d refers to language in use or stretches of use such as stories or conversations while discourse with big d is defined as different ways in which we humans integrate language with non language stuff such as different ways of thinking acting interacting valuing tools
This association of language with other stuff can be used to identify oneself as a member of a socially meaningful group or social network. Let's look at the following animation now. Let me just reproduce the dialogue that you saw in animation. Rani writing a diary. I'm just like any other mom. My kids are a handful. My husband works shifts and I have no time to myself. I wonder, could time grow on trees? Phone rings. Mother stops writing in diary to answer. Hello. Kajal. Hi Rani. Do you have a couple of hours to spare this afternoon? Rani. I wish I did, but it appears that I am stranded. The children have a holiday today and there's no one to watch my kids. Kajal, have you heard of mothers, nannies and sitters? I was also stuck once last month like this and my sister who uses this service when she needs to referred them to me. What a lifesaver. Call them at 777-5555. So what's happening here? Once again, this points at the roles of women in society. Looking after children is women's job and they need to be worried about this, whether they work in the environs of their homes or inside. The name of the child care center also suggests the same. So friends, you must have understood what critical discourse analysis is and how it can be used. But I'm sure uh, all of us require more practice in critical discourse analysis so that we have an orientation in what Fairclough calls critical language awareness. We could see that all approaches to critical discourse analysis aim at uncovering hidden agendas. We need to do that because we feel that we should not be tricked easily by others. We should not be influenced easily by others. We should be able to see through what others are trying to do to us. This is one of the main aims of critical discourse analysis. Thank you. Mm -hmm.